tonight, and if anything comes up, is just to talk about um, what the winning conditions are. Uh, in this case, Arnold's playing the United States of America, and I am playing the Jihadists. Um, you see the track there along the bottom, where it says Victory. It's sort of a multi-purpose track. It, it counts uh, how many different resources the, the different factions control. And you can see there are little notes all over the board around it that uh, indicate if you're playing solo, um, what the winning conditions are, or if you're playing head-to-head. -head. You can see that uh, the U.S. is attempting to essentially control, not control, but influence and establish good governance in uh, as many countries as possible. And if they get uh, a combination of fair and good countries equal to 15 out of the 18 Muslim countries there, that's an auto-victory condition for them. Um, if the jihadists manage to get at least 15 uh, mixture of poor or Islamist rule countries and degrade the U.S. prestige all the way down to the basement level of one, they will auto-win. And the WMD plot in the United States, right? We're getting, no, we're getting there. We're getting to the Big Bang. Okay, the other way is uh, you can see that all the countries listed up there have a little number in their upper upper uh, left. So right next to the country name in the title bar, it'll actually tell you uh, one, two, or three. And that's how many resources it provides. And if you get a combination of countries, so the United States can get at least 12 points worth of countries to, to have good governance, which is the little blue marker, and you don't see any out there right now to begin with. But if they get uh, 12 good countries out there in any combination or any uh, mixture of 12 points, then they automatically win. And if the Islamists do, uh, are attempting to do the same thing, if they can get a combination of 6 points with 2 of them being adjacent in some way, uh, for example, like they start with Afghanistan, you see there is Islamist. If they get that and say Pakistan, two of those are then adjacent, so that meets part of that criteria. They can get three more points, say the Gulf States or uh, Saudi Arabia or something like that. Then that's the six points that they need in resources. That's an auto victory for them as well. And I'd like to thank Trixie for showing off these things as I explain them. Uh, no explanation of rules is perfect without a good demonstration. So thank you, Trixie. Uh, please talk about you, Charles. Uh, those are the sort of the resource or uh, governance ways to win. That's the kind of the, the, the long range sort of grind out the game way. Uh, the other way is if the United States can zap away uh, and remove every single one of the little black cylinders from the board, which represent uh, cells uh, terrorist cells, they can remove those completely from the board. As we see in Afghanistan, they start with four. If at any time they've managed to eliminate all of them, then that's an instant win for the United States. If, uh, if jihadists, on the other hand, they can also, their most extreme way of, of uh, winning the game is if they can uh, acquire weapons of mass destruction and uh, do a terror plot that is not countered, and they get that uh, weapon into the United States over there in the upper left. Um, if at the end of a turn where they've released that plot and it just happens to be a WMD, uh, they have won instantly by nature of that. Big picture. Uh, that's that's the ultimate goal of what you're trying to do is as the two different sides. Um, What's great about this game is, is, like Twilight Struggle, you have different paths to victory depending on what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to be sneaky and try to get that WMD into the United States, it's hard, but uh, certainly uh, not impossible to do it. If you want to uh, just take the more methodical approach and work on the countries, you can take the political route. Uh, if you're the jihadists, you can you know, try to flood the world with terror cells and, and drive all the, the governance down and, uh, and do jihads, both major and minor, to achieve that goal, too. Um, we'll, we'll look at Afghanistan, since that's a good starting point. 
Um, we are playing the Let's Roll scenario, which starts uh, uh, like September 12, 2001, and this is kind of the lead up to the American involvement in Afghanistan. Um, so typically in this scenario, you see very early on one of the strategic choices that the United States will make is to perform a regime change there in Afghanistan to try to root out the Islamist rule. Um, but you can see that uh, every country has the, the title bar, like I was saying there. It will indicate whether it's uh, a Sunni or a, a, a Sufi uh, country by the nature of the type of crescent. And, uh, and then the stars represent that they're uh, non-Muslim countries. So certain events will affect different types of uh, Muslim nations. You can see the bar right there across the, the, the second row there, the ally, neutral, and adversary. And that just uh, tells you the current level of neutrality for the country. Uh, so your ultimate goal is to prevent, if you're the United States, you want to prevent that from getting all the way to the Islamist rule on one end of the spectrum. Uh, but you do want to kind of eventually move it all the way up to ally. And then once you get it to ally, then you can start improving its overall governance. So you can see that the, uh, the colored markers there, the poor, the fair, and eventually the good, um, they have a little number on them. And that indicates for the United States um, the level of card play needed. So for those poor countries there, uh, you need three ops to start you know, doing any of the actions in there. So it's pretty, pretty expensive. Whereas if you get them to fair and good, then it gets a little cheaper. So that's the ultimate goal for the United States. With, uh, with them being poor like that, for example, uh, it makes it easier for jihadist operations to, because they're all of their operations are determined by, uh, the success of them is determined by a dice roll. So when you have it down at a three like that, it's a 50% you know, a success ratio on a one, two, or three on the die roll. So obviously it gets harder for them if, if the governance improves because then it's harder to get that die roll success rate. And you have a, a variety of other countries there. The, the yellow countries represent uh, non-Muslim countries and they can all, you notice they don't have a governance track. They can really only be um, aligned either hard or soft, meaning that um, when we talk about the, the global war on terror, um, the United States is going to establish its position either hard or soft, as you see there to the left. Um, and just depending on the number of countries out there that are either uh, aligned or in opposition to, based on their own posture, um, that will significantly affect the success possibilities or the modifiers used when the when the U.S. is trying to do sort of uh, the, the war, uh, what's known as the war of ideas. So you're just trying to improve through dice means uh, the governance of some of these Muslim countries and if you have the world behind you it's a lot easier and if they're working against you then those negative modifiers affect your dice rolls. And uh, over there in Europe uh, the blue countries you can see are Shenzhen which means that um, all the countries that are uh, attached by way of the little uh, line uh, as we see throughout the map, any any country is considered geopolitically and geographically connected to whatever country it's it's got a line directly attached to. Um, several of them go right to the Shenzhen countries, and you can see that if, for example, I'm in uh, Libya, Libya is immediately attached uh, through the Shenzhen uh, Accords to any of the seven countries there in Europe that have that little Shenzhen marker on it. So technically, you can go from Libya all the way to Benelux or Eastern Europe just with a simple travel operation. Uh, okay, now the U.S. are not Shenzhen countries? No, they're not. Um, they're, you can see they're a lighter blue, so they are attached. The United Kingdom is attached to Shenzhen, but you still have to go through it um, to, to get there, so it's kind of a, a step-through process. Uh, indicators across the top, and I'll kind of explain those how we go. Like Twilight Struggle, this is just a sort of an action card driven game, and how it differs a little bit is that uh, you always play two cards back to back. So you can see Jihadist action phase is first, they play one card, resolve it, then they can play a second card. Um, like Twilight Struggle, you can 
you can play them for the ops points or the event if it is your uh, aligned event. So that means there are going to be some that are U.S. events, some that are jihadist, and then are some that are neutral. Um, and identical to Twilight Struggle, if you play an opponent's event, um, that event will be triggered. So keep that in mind when you're selecting what you're going to play. Um, so you do two back-to-back, -back and then the United States will get his two cards back-to-back. -back. And you just keep doing that back and forth until uh, the jihadists have used up all their cards, and, uh, and, the, and the jihadists are actually forced to. They have to use their entire hand. Whereas the United States, if they opt to, if they have one card left over, then they can hold that card for the next turn without any kind of, uh, there's no hand limit, so they can hold it on onto it in and get extra cards next turn to give them more options for, for the following turn. You can see right after the U.S. plays its uh, second action card there is a little thing called Resolve Plots. So um, the jihadists throughout their operations are going to try to seed little uh, terror plots throughout the world, either just kind of uh, miniature ones, you know, blowing up buses and things like that. I don't try to, to minimize that. I'm just saying they're not on par with the, the big ones, the WMD which are biological and nuclear in nature. Um, if they play those, those are significantly more effective um, for, for what they're trying to do. What happens is they'll seed those on their turn, or during their action phases. The United States will have a couple of cards in which they can try to um, alert the terror plot to kind of remove them from the board, uh, or do something to, to prevent it from happening. If they don't, if, they, if those are left unchecked, immediately after the U.S. action phase, that's when the, res the plots will be resolved. And if there's multiples on there, you'll go through and do them one at a time, and uh, the co consequences will be revealed. Moving over to the troops, we see that uh, the U.S. troop marker is kind of uh, goes hand in hand with the jihadist funding uh, track. They essentially work the same way. The cubes and cylinders come off from left to right, so you can see that the uh, the troops that are already on the board uh, represent four uh, four troops that have been taken off of that little low intensity box. Um, I guess they sort of represent stuff that was already out there prior to 2001. As you can see, if you start deploying troops off of the track and you start uh, moving into the war um, section of the box and then into the overstretch, so by doing that. You, uh, you are reducing the effectiveness in the future because you're overcommitting throughout the world. And you, as you can see, as the troops move to the right, whatever's in that box represents how many cards you're going to get in future turns. So you go from nine cards down to eight cards, all the way down to seven cards. So troop management is part of this game. You want to make sure that you don't, you don't spread yourself way too thin. Jihadists work the same way. Um, they take their cylinders there uh, from left to right. The cylinders actually have two sides. They, they uh, When they're just black like that, uh, you can't see anything. That's known as a sleeper cell. And at, at different points, those sleepers will become active. When they're active, that means that they're easier to be targeted and they can be uh, removed from the board. Um, that's a little crescent and star shown up on top, that means they're an active cell. So when they travel, um, if they're, it's one of the kind of whack-a-mole aspects of the game. Uh, when they get revealed, then the easiest way for them to disappear again is to travel to a different country, and we'll talk about how that works. But those uh, cells come from left to right, and as you see, that um, that is dependent on what kind of funding they've got. You see the uh, little jihadist funding there along the top track is at nine that's going to be reduced throughout the, the game as money dries up. Whenever that, whatever box that is in, um, you're allowed to have cells drawn from that box and anything to the left. So, for example, if it moved down to the six, the, the five cells that are in the seven, eight, nine box would not be available to you because they're too expensive. You don't have cash to provide for the, for the uh, jihads in that case.
the reserves um, at any time you can <coughs> you can opt to bank some of your cards so if you want to perform operations uh, in future turns you can bank up to one or two operations points from a card uh, voluntarily and then use it again on a subsequent round in case you have uh, a lower value card you can only use you have to use all the points at once so if I put two in there and I decide later on I want I have a one point card and I need to use a three for an operation I can use the two that are in reserve along with the card that I played and I can spend three ops at the same time if you don't use them by the end of the turn they they go away so it's something you just want to kind of you know monitor sometimes it's handy especially if you've got lots of one point or two point cards and you know you're going to need to do something really big at, towards the end of the turn and if you play a card for the uh, the one ops in the reserves that event still happens correct it's only in the discard at the bottom where it doesn't happen Correct. Anytime you use uh, your opponent's event, um, with the with one exception, and I'll talk about that in a second with the jihadist. But um, when you when you decide to use operations points, if it has an opponent's event, it is going to trigger that. Uh, that is, of course, if you meet the prerequisites of the event too. That's correct. Yeah. If. Uh, you know, if uh, something, if there's an if-then statement and you know it's not going to happen, by all means, you can you can certainly use it with uh, uh, with impunity because um, you know it's not going to happen for the jihadist. Okay, let's move over to the political tracks there on the left-hand side, towards the towards the bottom. Um, you have the overall U.S. global war on terror, or the GWAT uh, relations. And that just gives you um, the, the total comparison of the United States current position based on the uh, political party in charge, either you know Republicans or Democrats, um, how how uh, how much they want to prosecute the war on terror. I guess is probably the way to explain that best. Uh, and that can swing from uh, three to zero. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that the U.S. is always in alignment with whatever the majority of countries are out there. Um, and that, that number is, de is uh, determined by how many uh, hard countries there are, uh, or whatever the most is subtracted from the least, if that makes any sense. So right now you've got Israel is in there as a hard country, and there are no soft countries. So it's a 1 minus 0 basically means that it's 1 on the hard side and the United States just happens to be hard as well which gives you a plus one to your uh, war on terror rolls. What you don't want to happen is uh, to be on the opposite end of that so if, uh, if the presidency were to change and uh, the new political strategy is to, to adopt a, sa a soft uh, uh, attitude towards a war on terror and the rest of the world is going hard or vice versa then it can very easily swing to three in the opposite direction which will be a huge negative modifier towards your uh, political roles when you're trying to make uh, war of ideas roles okay I'm going to restate that question because I, I took the recording off for that um, so the negative effects happen if you're on opposite sides of the global war on terror track but if you're on the same side, there is no effect. Exactly. It's plus zero most of the time. Uh, if you're on opposite side, it can be a negative one, a negative two, or a negative three. Okay. Right below that, uh, the, the straight up U.S. prestige is just how effective the U.S. is at selling the idea of um, their war on ideas, or war of ideas, on uh, Muslim extremism. So you can see that uh, runs from 1 to 12, and uh, in different little sections there, it will show you um, how how successful they are. So if they're in that 7, 8, 9 box, they get a plus 1 modifier to their war of ideas, where you really want to be if you're the United States is somewhere up 10, 11, 12. And that gets uh, moved around quite a bit, depending on the, the type of events that you uh, perform. So if you go in there and do a regime change, there could be political fallout from that. And it's possible that that may shift very positively or very negatively. 
um, when jihadists perform uh, jihad uh, plots around the country, around the world, that's going to affect the U.S. prestige as well. Uh, the most significant one is if uh, whenever the uh, jihadists manage to perform a a weapon of mass destruction, if they detonate a nuke wherever there are U.S. troops, they automatically go from wherever they are all the way down to number one. So that's a huge penalty for the U.S. in the eyes of the world. And we have a lot of countries out there that are just completely neutral at the start of this. And through um, different operations by the jihadists and the United States, either performing war, war of ideas or the jihadists attempting to move into those countries or establish cells and recruitment there, a lot of those are going to start uh, being identified by their uh, positioning or alignment with the United States and their governance. And more often than not, you're going to look at something in the fair to poor, most likely poor, range, and they're going to be neutral. Um, war events and other cards and, and major events like that are going to shift those things pretty significantly. But the ultimate goal for both sides is to really just kind of control those alignments. Um, the United States, more decidedly so, they, they want to get those up to good ally as quickly as possible. Um, so it really just depends on what your strategy is. If you want to go with the, the governance and get good countries or fair countries, that's one way to do it. If you're just trying to get resources, you can, you can focus on a few of them and use the tools in your toolbox to try to secure those and make sure that the good resources are available for you. So what do we do? Well, on your turn, um, I've got my little handy dandy charts here, and uh, since this is an asymmetrical game, and, and proud of it, man, um, both the U.S. and the jihadists can do different things. They have, like I said, different tools in their toolbox to affect the change that they need. Um, just kind of running through them really quickly, um, I don't know if anybody else has their charts there, but if you want to follow along, you can. Essentially, the U.S. has the War of Ideas, both uh, in Muslim countries, uh, where they're attempting to improve the alignment first and then the governance. Then they have the war of ideas in the non-Muslim countries to just kind of affect, to establish whether or not they're hard or soft. So they can do both of those. And those are affected uh, directly by the current U.S. prestige and the relations for the U.S. global war on terror. The U.S. can also do disruption, um, which is where if they've got a, a if they're in a, a non-Muslim uh, country or a country that is currently set as a Muslim country that is currently an ally, or any country where they have at least two troops, like Gulf states or Saudi Arabia, there, uh, if there is a cell present, they can attempt to do a disruption. And the way that works is, uh, if it's a sleeper cell, they immediately kind of flush them out and they become active cells. If it's an active cell, then they uh, will remove them from the board. So it's kind of a two-step process, and you can't can't do it all at once. You have to do you have to flush them out first, make them active using your intelligence, and then subsequent ones will get rid of them. If you manage to get rid of all the uh, cells in a particular country, they will they have a thing called a, a cadre, which is really just a placeholder. And that allows that, s that cell to reconstitute later on in another time. Normally what happens is you can only, uh, jumping ahead to the jihadists, but normally they can only add cells where they already have a cell presence. Um, so it kind of uh, is in their best interest to spread around and, and activate new cells in new countries. But a disruption allows you to kind of chip away at that. And since that's one of the ways that the U.S. can win the game is to get rid of all those cells, that, that is certainly a viable strategy. When you perform an alert, that's uh, that was the counter to uh, if there are known if you see pl plots out there. If the jihadist player has put plots during his two action cards, and you want to attempt to stop those, then you uh, perform the alert, which is always a three op card. So no matter what, you're you're blowing a three op card on that, and you select and reveal basically one marker. Uh, so if there are multiples out there, it's that's where you get to pick. 
and if you're lucky enough to pick the one that's a weapon of mass destruction, you have removed that from the game completely, which is very, very good for the United States. Otherwise, if it's just a standard one, two, or three plot, it just gets put face back, face down, back in the pile, and can pop up again later on. Moving over to the uh, deployment, and uh, the, the the use of troops is actually kind of goes hand in hand with uh, three different operations. The most direct one being deploy where you can play a, uh, you target an ally country, uh, it's got to be an ally Muslim country, and, or if you want to move stuff from countries back to the troop track, you can certainly do that with the deploy. But um, you just play a card and you move any number of set of uh, troops from the track to an ally country back and forth, however you like. Um, so that is a good way if you if you've secure a country and you want to get it out of there, or if you want to move troops to another country that you feel may be threatened, uh, that's at good ally status, then that is uh, definitely a way to, to move your troops about around the board. The most extreme way to do that is to, uh, is to perform what's known as a regime change. And like I said, that usually happens very early on for a country like Afghanistan there. Um, Prerequisite is it has to be a country that's under Islamic rule, so you can see Afghanistan meets that. Um, the United States must be in a hard posture, so they have that from the beginning of the game as well. And uh, they have to play a three-op card, and it's an automatic thing. You play the three-op card, you say, I'm doing a regime change in this country, and boom. The first thing you do is you put, you have to have at least six troops available from somewhere, from the track most likely. and you put them in that country. If that country has any cells, they all immediately go active because they're fighting off the crusading invaders. And uh, it becomes your ally, but you have to figure out what level of ally it is, either uh, good, fair, or poor. Most likely it's going to be a poor ally. And uh, you put a regime change marker in there. And that's going to stay there until you can actually stabilize the country. And while it's either at Islamist rule or a regime change, uh, then cells are automatic for that country. It can constantly promote new terrorists. So that's one of the things that the United States has to be uh, aware of, that that's the trade-off, that you know all those cells are just going to keep coming back from that country, even though it's your ally now. And finally, the last thing you can do with the troops is if, if things have gone completely south, and the United States is at a soft posture in the war on terror. They can play three ops, and they can remove all the troops from a uh, target country that is currently under regime change. So if they don't want to be stuck in a quagmire, giggity, um, they can they can be removed from there back to another country or back to the troop track. Unfortunately, the fallout for that is that it becomes a besieged regime, which means that uh, you put a little marker on there, and uh, it's like an automatic success for uh, jihadists. So if they're trying to travel there or recruit cells or anything like that, it's, again, pretty much automatic for them. So, uh, you know, leaving a country in the lurch like that is, is not the most uh, preferable thing to do. <laughs> And lastly, the the, uh, the United States, if they really need to, what they do, uh, they can kind of reassess their attitude on the war on terror. So if the whole world is going soft and the United States is still uh, hard, for example, uh, it might be worthwhile to change that position and make it align more uh, favorably with the rest of the rest of the world so that you're not having to deal with all those negative modifiers in the, in the U.S. global war on terror. So what you do is you play two three-op cards, just back-to-back, because uh, that's your whole uh, two-card phase, action phase there. And you just flip it. So you sh shift it from hard to soft or vice versa. And that pretty much eats up that entire turn. But, you know, could have significant advantage to do that. So that's pretty much the, the you know, that's what 
the United States gets to do in this game. Um, obviously, event-driven cards are going to be helpful at certain times. There are a lot of things that allow you to um, make immediate changes to both countries and to uh, cells that are on the board. So, you know, just depending on what you got in your hand, you want to use those effectively. On the back of the chart there, they've got the uh, the dice roll 